Friends, <clears throat> since it's Christmas, I have a present for you. I have a riddle for you. What do you call a cat crossing the desert on Christmas Day? Sandy Claws. Yeah, well. Uh, this, you know, um, I don't have to tell you this. This is a, a very unusual Christmas. Unlike Christmases in the past. And I was thinking earlier about ways that it, it's the same as Christmas in the, in the past. One of the things that has not changed, and I don't think it ever will change, is I don't know if you ever thought about this, but the colors that we use in Christmas decorations. I don't know who, I don't know who determines that. Who, who determines, for instance, that Halloween, if you're going to decorate, you, you use orange and black. And if you're decorating for Easter, you're using pastel colors. In the same way, universally, in Christmas decorations, you find three colors. One of them is red. Civil authorities use red to warn us of danger, to tell us to watch out. In a traffic signal, it tells you to stop. The church associates the color red with martyrs, those who shed their blood, gave their lives for Christ. It's a color that tells us that life is uncertain and difficult. It's a good color for Christmas. Life was uncertain and difficult that first Christmas. Think about that. You're, you're, you're uh, nine months pregnant and you travel 90 miles on the back of a donkey to be away from home with no place to stay and no friends or family and you deliver a child that's born in a stable in Palestine. The crush scene that you see here, we put the baby Jesus there a moment ago, evokes thoughts of silent night and holy night. But as a matter of fact, if you were to go into a home in the Middle East today, to say nothing of 2,000 years ago, your, your notion of cleanliness and, and, and hygiene would be ravaged, your sense of smell would be violated, that's in the home. You can only imagine what it was like in a stable 2,000 years ago. Life was difficult and uncertain when Jesus was born. And life is like that for many of us this Christmas. Some of us who celebrate Christmas this year are without people who are always there in the past. That's tough. And we are faced with uncertainties about pandemic, about employment, about our children, our relationships, our health, and the future. Red is a good color for Christmas because it reminds us that life is uncertain, life is difficult. That's what we needed to be reminded these days anyway. But the second Christmas color is, of course, green. Traffic signals use green to tell us that it's okay to go forward, go, it's okay to go ahead. In nature, it's a sign of life, of growth, of vibrancy. It's the color of spring. In the church, it's a symbol of hope, optimism. We wear green vestments all summer long. And it's a good Christmas color because it speaks of new life, new beginnings, a reason for hope, a reason for optimism. Even though life is dangerous and difficult, because of Christmas, because of the coming of Christ, the forces of death, the forces of evil, the forces of darkness will never have the final word. We will always be able to go ahead knowing that our life is headed in a happy direction, that our life is going to have a happy conclusion because of what happened at Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. And the third color for Christmas, it's always a bright, brilliant color. Sometimes it's white, sometimes it's silver, sometimes it's gold. 
but its meaning is always the same. It speaks of light coming into the darkness. St. John, you know, when he wrote his gospel, he was the, he was the last uh, it was the last gospel to be written, and he probably had the other three gospels ahead of him. And uh, so, John, when, when when you read John's Christmas story, you don't you don't have the manger scene, and you don't have the shepherds, and you don't have the angels. He tells us what it all means. He uses the language of symbol. He says the light came into the darkness, and the darkness could not put it out. One of the names that comes to my mind at Christmas, many years ago, I, in fact, I started out as a priest in Niagara Falls, and I didn't know anything about Niagara Falls, the city or, or the falls. I did a little research because when you, when you live there, and I had people coming from, you know, I, who would be coming uh, that I would be the guide for, so I want to know something about Niagara Falls. I came across the name of Marcel Blondin, B-L-O-N-D-I-N, Big, big name in the, in the falls in the 1860s. He did things that nobody else could do. He would walk across the gorge on a tightrope, without a net, obviously. He did it many times. People would come from miles around, thousands of people, to see him do a, a, a daredevil act. And years later, uh, he explained uh, what his secret was. Prior to his getting onto the tightrope the day or two before, he went over to the other side and he erected a, a, a bright silver star somewhere where it was very visible, like on a tree. And he, when he got on the tightrope, as long as he kept his eyes on that star, he was fine. He could not look up, he could not look down, he could not look around. Keep rivet, his eyes riveted on that star. And he was okay. He, did, he was successful. And for us, I, I see that as kind of like a little parable or an image. For us, sometimes life seems like we're walking on a tightrope above a dangerous gorge. And at Christmas, Jesus says... Keep your eyes on me and you will do okay. Keep your eyes on me and you will be fine. One final thought. You know, in the, in the um, circle of people that you associate with, the people that you, in your family and you know, at your school or at your workplace or neighborhood and so forth, many of them will not see the light of Christ. They, they will not be coming here to church uh, to, 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 as you have, to, to seek the light, to worship the Lord, and they will not be finding him in the scriptures for whatever reasons. But they will see and they can see the light of Christ reflected in you. They can see the light of Christ reflected in you. And we need to keep that in, in mind. We need especially to keep that in mind when we t talk to kids about the meaning of Christmas. And I know many people are concerned, you know, that it's, be it's becoming commercialized. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're people, many people are, don't understand what the true meaning is. And parents and grandparents want to, want to teach their kids and their grandchildren what Christmas is really all about. It's about the birth of Christ, about Jesus coming into the world. But sometimes they stop. It's about Jesus coming into the world as the light of the world. But, and these are his words, he says, you are the light of the world. And what he meant was, we who, we who are enlightened by Christ, it's, it's our job now uh, to go and be Christ-like to other people so that they will see the light of Christ reflected in us. Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they will see your good works and give praise to the Father. Not praise to you, praise to the Father because all light, all goodness comes from the Father. So you may be the only entrance 
passageway for people to encounter Christ. Remember the words of an old song, an old poem, actually. You are writing a gospel, a chapter a day. By the deeds that you do and the words that you say, you are writing each day a gospel. Take care that the writing is true, for the only gospel that some people will read is the gospel according to you. Merry Christmas.